Right. So, sorry about oh, that. I can't see the screen, Rabbi. No. Right. Sorry about that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and I thought so. Okay. Um, so, we'll give Brenda a minute to come back. Issues. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Morning, Beryl. Okay. Morning. <laughs> okay, so um, Iris isn't here. I, I guess I'll do the summary. I did it on Shabbos. So unusual this year, Vayaka and Pekude are very often together, but because of the leap year, they're split up. It's quite unusual that. Um, one second. My computer has frozen. All right. It's going to be one of those days. It was, I knew it was too good to be true. Okay, just to talk amongst yourselves and I wait for it to unfreeze. Yeah. Um, I said, um, good morning, lovely day. Hope you're feeling a little stronger. Lovely day. I don't know if it's warm enough, but maybe you can go. Oh, it's frozen. Is that okay? Oh, lo lovely. We are well. We are supposed to go to the hospital. Right. Okay. But just we can get medical insurance so we can so miss you. Miss you too. Determine not to work. Oh, we're trying to get up to move to the next slide. Not to tea. Come on. Oh. Ah, there we go. Ah, it's gone too far. Okay, right, here we go. Ready? So yeah. this is the summary of Bayakel. So Moshe assembles the people of Israel, and he reiterates to them the commandment of Shabbos, right? Bayakel starts off with the mitzvah of keeping Shabbos. He then gives God's instructions regarding the making of the Mishkan. Um, Bayakel of Kudah, you might recall, is, is very much a restatement of the previous three parshas. Um, the first time it's God's instructions. And the second time, it's the it's the relation it's it's the related of the story of the people actually doing it. So um, they donate the required materials in advance, bringing gold, silver, and copper, blue, purple, and red, crimson, actually dyed wool, goat hair, spun linen, animal skins, wood, olive oil, herbs, and precious stones. And we said this is the only time in history they ever had to stop a campaign that was too successful. Moshe says, "You've given enough. We've got too much. Please stop." Then we have this team of wise-hearted artisans. Who make the Mishkan and its furnishings, as we read in the previous parshas. Three layers of roof coverings, 48 gold plated wall panels, 100 silver foundation sockets, the parochet, the veil, the curtain that separates between the two chambers, the masach, the screen that goes in front of it, the ark, the cover with the cheruvim, right? The cheruvim, so cheruvim, the uh, angels on the top of the ark, which is very uh, ornate, the table with its showbread, the shulchan. The seven branch menorah with the special oil, the golden altar, the incense with its specific formula, the anointing oil, the outdoor altar for the burnt offerings, and all the implements described in great detail the various uh, equipment and implements. Right, the hangings, the posts, the foundation sockets, the basin, the kiol, which we learned about last week, etc., and the pedestal made of copper mirrors, all these things in great detail. They right? all have one obvious thing in common. Number one, they're very kind of ornate. And number two, they're very materialistic. Okay, and who who makes these things? Of course, it was Betzalel and Oholiav, who were the craftsmen that made. I think I saw someone at Betzalel with only thirteen recently. Quite amazing. Um, who made the Mishkan and the furnishings? It's funny, by the way. Um, I might be wrong because you now one thing is if you if you if you look at, ever look at lists of Israeli names. So unfortunately, the hostages we've obviously seen a lot of lists of names. There's a lot of modern names. There's a lot of names that you don't really hear in the diaspora. Um, so I might be wrong, but to my knowledge, there's lots of people people called Betzalel. Not lots. It's not uncommon. But I've never met anyone called Oholi Oholiav, and yet they're both mentioned together. So anyway, right. So source number one is all about the appointment of Betzalel and Oholiav. So who would like to read number one? I'll read. Be abandoned. Right. Go. Then Moses said to the Israelites, Know that the Lord has chosen Batzalel, son of Uri, 
the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and has filled him with a divine spirit of wisdom, understanding and knowledge in every craft, to make artistic designs for the work in gold, silver and bronze, as well as cutting stones for setting, carving wood, engaging in every other craft. He has also given him the ability to teach others, together with Ohalia, son of Ashimasha, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with the skill to do all the kinds of work as engravers, designers, embroiderers, in sky blue, purple or scarlet wool or fine linen. And as weavers, they will be able to carry out all the necessary work and design. So it's the Tal and who are going to make the Mishkan, <coughs> the furnishings, and basically be celebrated throughout the ages as craftsmen who use their skills for the glory of God. It's interesting, right? No mention of doctors, lawyers, or accountants in the Torah, but what is the divinely inspired profession that said that you get that God gives you the spirit of wisdom and understanding to achieve is being a craftsman, right? being a silversmith or a, 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 a carpenter or a embroiderer or a weaver. Like these are very, uh, you know, do you ever hear everyone say, you know, my son's got engaged to a nice Jewish embroiderer? It's such a godly profession. No one ever says that. But actually, this is a very hallowed profession. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the Havdil, of course, um, the stonemasons, not stonemasons, sorry, the Freemasons, right? that all started with masonry, didn't it? Which was obviously held up to very high, uh, as a very high craft. So uh, just something to think about generally, our relationship with art and with music, right? And with the arts more generally. So obviously, if you're talking in terms of like modern day Hollywood and, you know, art galleries and pop music, there are all kinds of issues of what is or is not suitable within traditional Jewish values, right? A lot of songs are offensive or, you know, talk about um, quite explicit love or, you know, maybe drug use. Um, a lot of art is not necessarily what we would call modest. So those are probably the issues that get in the way for a lot of people of appreciating the arts. But the idea of having a, an appreciation of, of imagery, of art or of music or of poetry um, is an interesting one because in many circles it's not really valued very much in other circles it is and then you have for example you go to Sfat there are many Hasidic artists who do the most wonderful you know produce the most wonderful work and very very evocative and so on and so forth who may or may not have had formal training but obviously it's a very different genre from you know what you'll find in the Tate Modern so we see that there is a source for this kind of uh, you know craft in the Torah that the, the, the the Mishkan required very elaborate design. Um, it, it seems to run, we, ha, we kind of have a, an idea in our head, I suppose, that we're often quite minimalist about you know, material things, you know, because, you know, it's not all about material things. And we complain when people spend too much money on bar mitzvahs and things. But on the other side, we see that the ultimate home of God was very intricate with all kinds of very, you know, had to be crafted very very carefully and very specially um there's a good reason that we play down material things and aesthetics because everyone else was talking about you know they would they would serve their gods with a lowercase g by building you know huge um structures and temples and amphitheaters and statues and so on and we of course worshipped the invisible god who transcended physical Right, God had no image. Right, even at Sinai, right, what are we told? I'll just read. It's a nice short one. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no image. There was only a voice. We heard God on Sinai. We didn't see some. We saw the the thunder and lightning, but we didn't we didn't see God. Okay. <laughs> and of course, number three, it's going to be um, another Benden reading. I think uh, Brenda or Mordechai, who would like to read number three? I'll read if you like. Do not make on the Ten Commandments. Off you go. Yes. Do not make yep. for yourself any carved image or likeness of in the form of any creature in heaven above or 
the earth beneath or in the waters below. Right, and we don't know can't, you can't have, I've seen like fish and things on um, windows and things. You can't, shouldn't have had that. There seems to be a consensus. I don't, I'm not. I'm not familiar with all the details. So there seems to be a consensus that two dimensional is different from three dimensional. So um, I know there are people, particularly in the more kind of Hasidic world, that maybe don't like to have pictures of themselves. But I don't think it's because of idolatry. I think it's because of modesty. There's a story about someone. I, I don't know. I mean, this is a story. There was a chap, an old Hasid, who was in court once and he was asked to identify a picture of himself. And like he hadn't looked in the mirror in 20 years because he just had no concern with appearance so he didn't even know what he looked like i mean I, you know i don't know there's, but that's more out of modesty um some religions may have an issue even with two-dimensional images i think the general consensus is the, the problem is more with 3d images so statues busts things like that right whether it's people or animals or interestingly because it does say you shouldn't make an image of the stars either so if you build a planetarium or something that's quite interesting gomorrah talks about i don't remember who it was that had pictures of the moon on his wall so that when the witnesses would come about the the new moon he would say did it look like this or like that there's a whole discussion about whether you're allowed to make those images um but i think generally we're more sensitive to 3d than 2d so photos are fine but statues and michael Ranger always posts a picture of ben gurion with a big bust in um in the airport right and he always says you know just just checking in with ben gurion before i leave or whatever so um i don't know if ben gurion was particularly cared about these things but you don't generally do that in Judaism, right? You don't make busts of people, even just, you know, the heads. And you certainly don't make statues of people. I believe there's a statue of the Maharal somewhere in Prague, which the local council put up out of respect. I don't know if it's still up, but it was up once at some point. And the irony is, of course, that, that for a Jew, you wouldn't want a statue made, right? You know, so it says, oh, Rabbi Sachs was such a great teacher. Let's make a statue of him in Parliament. Like, no, we, we don't do that. We don't, we don't have that. So, um, we're very sensitive about it, right? Whereas, of course, the Greeks or, you know, Buddhists, you're always having little images and statues and what have you. So I think for all of those reasons, there was always a sensitivity to these things. On the other hand, we do have objects. Yeah. Right? You know, I often get asked when people come to visit the shore, you yeah. know, you could say it's very ignorant. I've had kids ask, you know, where is the cross? Where is the, where is the image of, the, of, of Mary? I say, well, first of all, wrong religion right yes. secondly we don't have images of people in shul Quite at all right we're very careful not to um but we do have images right sitzes to fill them they're referred to as a sign an image mezuzah right there is the concept also of something called hiddo mitzvah right where we beautify a mitzvah that's why you're supposed to have a nice silver cup for kiddush that's why on Saturday night you're supposed to put out your best dishes on the table so it should look very fine. That's why you're supposed to put a nice fine tablecloth on your table for Shabbos. It should look nice. You're supposed to wear nice clothes, right? Your safer Torah is not in a paper bag. It's adorned with velvet, with silver, with gold. Why? It's very superficial, right? Surely, if you drop the bells from a safer Torah, you don't fast. But if you drop the safer Torah, you fast, right? Why? Because the safer Torah is a holy thing. So why can't it just be in a paper bag? Why does it have to be in a, a velvet cover? Why does it have to have, you know, jewelry because that's as human beings that's how we adorn things that's how we make things look special going dollar wore special clothes right when the queen king opens parliament the queen gets open parliament they wear a crown right they look very regal right they wouldn't look the same in just a suit right that's just one of those things so on the one hand we always have a sensitivity to imagery particularly of people or of god or of any attempt to portray anything divine on the other hand the whole mishkan was about material imagery <coughs> had to be just so, and they had to be crafted very specially. So, you know, the framework, the hangings, right, the carving of the Provim on the, on the Ark was very intricate. The menorah, like we said, the menorah was so intricate, Moshe didn't know how to do it. Hashem had to show him an image in fire because it was so intricate, right? If you ever look at the pictures in the art scroll, you know, it wasn't just a, a simple menorah like you have nowadays. It had all these designs and the little, you know, the pomegranate shapes and things. It's very intricate. Very intricate. So why? So let's look at the sort of the hashkoff of the, the religious thinking behind when we do glorify physical things, right? And by the way, you know, a wedding dress, it's supposed to be modest, but at the same time, no one said, oh, you know, 
uh, if you're really from, you should get married in a very plain, you know, just a sheet. Because why would you have a fancy wedding dress? It's about what's inside that counts. You know what? People still like to have nice wedding dresses. You know, so the groom gets a new hat, whatever it is. Um, you're supposed to dress up for Shabbos. Right? You're supposed to do certain things in a very, uh, in a very, you know, lav not a lavish way, but a dignified way. Right? And then on the other hand, when we bury people, we put everyone in plain shrouds because we're all the same. So sometimes we do obsess over material things, sometimes we don't. Let's have a look. So source number four. Monica, you want to read? I think oh. you've, got to, you've got to unmute. He's passing. Okay, I'll read it. Okay. So we do, this is this week's Tedra. It says regarding the clothing that you make for the Kohanim, you should make sacred garments, right? Holy clothes for our and your brother, for what? Lechavod, for honor, for dignity, Urusiforis, and for adornment, for beauty, right? Not for God. God doesn't need the Kohen to look nice. Right? It's for adornment, for dignity, and for beauty. And I presume that means for the optics, for the people who will see. The Kohen doesn't just wear regular clothes, he wears special clothes. A uh, uniform, you know, uniform is people don't wear ties anymore. People don't wear suits anymore. You know, um, we're not as formal as we used to be. Uh, you can argue the pros and cons of that, right? In some ways it's good, in some ways it's not. You know, sometimes they say, oh, the new king is going to do away with some of the some of the more obscure pageantry. You know what? Once you get rid of it, it never comes back. And there's something you know, people come from far and wide to see the change of the guard. Why? Because I don't think you have that in America. Or in Israel, we have such formality and such um, tradition, you know, and such elaborate, um, uh, um, what's the word, protocols and rituals, right? Human beings, they like that, right? It, yeah. Yes. It's something that talks to us. We like formality. People enjoy, you know, people actually enjoy getting dressed up, or they used to. You go out, you know, a black tie event, you get dressed up for it. People enjoy that. You know, you get dressed up for shawl on Shabbos. You get dressed up for a wedding or a bar mitzvah. You know, you get dressed up for a levaya or a shiva. The current trend where, you know, it's interesting. I've seen it particularly, I have to say, at levayas and shivas. It used to be, it would be unthinkable to go to a cemetery in jeans or women in trousers. You know, you would dress the way you would for sure. Now, even very respectable people, you know, you've got a levaya, they've got two shirt buttons undone, you know, the shirt's out maybe, you know, leather jacket, jeans, I, it does shock me. It really does. And we, we, don't, we don't value the, the um, external in the same way perhaps we did once. Some, some of that's good because the external has to be internal as well. But some of it's a shame we've lost that certain edge. Now, I love, now by Shochet told the story during lockdown um, that his grandparents were hiding in, during the war in, in um, I think it was in Amsterdam. It was in Holland somewhere, I think it was Amsterdam. And they're in hiding for, I think, weeks or months, you know, sort of Anne Frank style. And every Friday, his grandmother said to his grandfather, whatever his name was, you need to put a tie on because it's Shabbos, you know. So, uh, well, no one's going to see me. No, but it's, you know, it's that sense of purpose and self, right? You know, it, often you, you'll have an older gentleman that is never seen without a, you know, like Ron Kemp was always dressed up nicely, a suit and a tie, you know. It, yep. it, it makes you feel good about yourself. Oh, you Gives just certain dignity, right? You know, you always have his hair nicely done, thanks to Jeff as well, right? So you a certain dignity. So there's something to be said for these things. So let's have a look at what Maimonides says in his Guide for the Perplexed about the physicality of the Mishkan. And then let's relate it a little bit perhaps to physical imagery and art and things like that. So um, I guess, Jeff or Brenda, we're back to you. Oh, yeah. Oh. Most people are influenced by aesthetic and considerations, which is why the sanctuary was designed to inspire admiration and awe. Why a continual light burned there? Why the priestly robes were so impressive? Why there was music in the form of the Levitical choir? And why incense was burned to cover the smell of the sacrifices that's interesting oh, that's interesting so you've yeah. got you've got you've got like sight imagery you've got hearing you've got the music and you've got you've got three out of five senses you haven't got touch or taste you've got the smell 
you've got the sound and you've got the the sight. It's interesting, right? These are all very very superficial on the surface, but they're also important. It says most people are influenced by aesthetic considerations. There you have it, right? So we can moan about it and say we should all be monks and we should just go live, you know, wear sheep simple robes and live on bread and water. Number one, that's not the Jewish way. Number two, it doesn't work. Human beings are hardwired to be impressed by uh, magnificence, right? Impressed by magnificent buildings. That's why all these shawls are built to look like cathedrals and have to, right? Impressed. The temple is a very impressive building, right? So, it's really, and actually, that, he goes one step further. So, this is Rambam again. This is in something called his introduction to the Shemona Parakim. It's actually on the Mishnah. See what he has to say. A bit of mental health advice here. So, Brenda, would you like to read? Uh, yeah, someone afflicted. Afflicted. I'm sorry. Someone afflicted with melancholy may dispel it by listening to music and various kinds of song, by strolling in the garden, by experience beautiful buildings, by associating with beautiful pictures and similar similar sorts of things that broaden the soul. Yes, that's Isn't that very interesting. Isn't that interesting. Right, that's you know, so there's even brochas you say when you see a natural thing of natural beauty. So should we all sit and study Torah all day and daven and do mitzvahs and okay, ideally. Um yeah. is there value to... that there was a program on television, a little snippet on one of the news is that somebody's going around making people dance um to um to alleviate um mental right. uh, mental stress. stress. Yes, not illness, but stress. Dancing it's interesting. Yeah. Dancing is a very powerful thing. There was a there was a famous clip going around. There was some yeshiva bochen that were stuck in a tra traffic jam for three hours, like going from somewhere, New York to somewhere, and that everyone was really fed up, and they just got out and started dancing, and like it went viral. It was about you know seeing the joy in life and things like that. So, and of course, what's the example we all know in Tanakh? King Saul, Shaul, right? The, the David's music was a was a I can't think of the word. A, a tonic to him, right? It music. Um, what's the phrase? Music, something in the soul, can't think. Revives, revives the weary soul, right? Music, obviously, I'm very into music, but also says natural beauty, appreciating beautiful pictures, right? It's interesting. So, so is there value in let's assume there's no sneal issues, let's put that on side for a minute. The actual like comment is there value in listening to music? in going for walks in the countryside to experience nature in and these are different things by the way one is natural in going to an art gallery to see inspirational pictures or reciting poetry or oh, is, is there value to these things according to Rambam the answer is yes because it connects on a deeper level it's an expression of something let's see what Rav Cook says about it yeah, I'll read this this is very interesting this is in the um in his commentary on the Siddur so he says, literature, painting, and sculpture, hold that thought, give material expression to all the spiritual concepts implanted in the depths of the human soul. As long as even one single line hidden in the depth of the soul has not been given out with expression, then it is the task of art, which is called abodat ha umanot, to bring it out. Now, a craftsman is called an uman. Okay? Yeah. And interesting word because it sounds awfully like the word emuna which means faith so maybe there's a way of deepening one's faith and one's bond is through expressions through craft through art through music through natural beauty through painting through literature right um there are many i, I think it's a new phenomenon again if you go to the fact you'll see lots of artists it's all art that is inspired by religious phenomena right it's art that expresses, you know, whether it's expressing a story in Tanakh or a religious concept or our relationship with God or the soul or the beauty of, you know, something. Right? Obviously, music, Jewish music is written to express concepts. There's some very moving songs that, you know, Bahisha Amda is now a very popular song for years. Bahisha Amda, I love say, you know. Um, that's from the God. It's a very powerful expression of our faith in that God has not abandoned us. So all these things. So Rav Cook says, so interestingly, he says, literature, painting, and sculpture. Now, sculpture is a controversial one. Mm -hmm. Because we said previously, 
we are very sensitive to 3D images. So interestingly, it seems that in later editions, they revised it to say literature, it's design and tapestry. So they took out the word sculpture. Sculpture might be controversial. The sculpture is three dimensional imagery, which we said we generally, if it's an image of a person, we'd be very wary of. So just interesting. That's Rav Cook, right? Um, there was an artist called Boris Schatz in 1906. He adopted the name Bertalo as his pen name, as it were. Not pen name, I thought you would call it, brush name. Um, and Rav Cook wrote a very nice letter about supporting his school of art. He saw art as a symbol of regeneration um, and as spiritual. Um, and this is what Rav Cook actually said to a Jewish sculptor. Now, not everyone would necessarily agree with this, but I think this is quite fascinating. But this is what Rav Cook said to a Jewish sculptor. Jeff, would you like to read again? Yeah. When I lived in London, I used to visit the National Gallery. And my favourite pictures were those of Rembrandt. I really think that Rembrandt was a Sabbath. Do you know that when I first saw Rembrandt's works, they reminded me of the Rabonic statement about the creation of light? We are told that when God created light on the first day of creation, as opposed to the natural light of the sun on the fourth day, it was the strong and so strong. It was so strong and pellucid that oh, one could see from one end of the world to the other. But God was afraid that the wicked might abuse it. But what did he do? He reserved that light for the righteous in the world to come. But now and then there are great men who are blessed and privileged to see it. I think that Rembrandt was one of them, and the light in his pictures is the very light that God created on Genesis Day. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. That's quite interesting. So yeah. I'm not sure all of the, I think some of the Haredi world would probably get a bit upset by that, but this is quite interesting. So I'm not familiar really with, I'm not a great art, I'm, I'm familiar with music more than art, but um, evidently Rembrandt painted the light in people's faces. Does that sound right? And yeah, just ordinary faces, Absolutely. and yes. he didn't embellish it. He just painted very, very ordinary scenes. He saw the beauty of the ordinary. So a uh, cook saying that saying the, the the beautiful the beauty of the light of creation that being created the image of God and just this light that we often don't see was was evident in his work. So there's a whole discussion. Evidently, I didn't know this about whether Rembrandt was influenced by Jewish people he knew, and uh, my sack suggests that Rav Cook's admiration was more to do with this idea of light. As an artist, you express the idea of light. Uh, pellucid means trans, translucent, but I have to look that up. Clear. Uh, 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 clear. Um, as we said, in Hebrew, art is called umanot, which is like emunah, faithfulness. So a true artist can, if, if it is, people say that was a very faithful rendition or a faithful reproduction or a faithful... Um, uh, reconstruction or whatever it is so if you do it right then it can actually strengthen people's faith it can strengthen people's yep. connection it can be a very powerful thing we know the power of art yeah. right so uh, let's see some poetry from um this is from who william blake and manny hopkins to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour right i don't think william blake, blake was a rabbi I think he was even Jewish. He said that when you see, when you appreciate nature from, from just a grain of sand, and you see not just a grain of sand, but you see the power, right? God's power, the whole world. You see a flower, you see the power of heaven. You are basically holding infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity. In other words, one is connecting through these natural things, natural, we're not even talking about art now, we're talking about natural beauty, right? It's a, it's a, it's a to, you know, to go to the Grand Canyon, which I have done, is breathtaking. It's breathtaking. It's, it's very hard to take in. You know, it's a natural ph phenomenon. It's, it, is, it gives you some appreciation of the majesty of Hashem. Like to see a you know, beautiful tree or a beautiful forest. Or, uh, you don't generally have that experience when you see a skyscraper, to be honest, or a road. But, yeah, right? Manny Hopkins said, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. I don't know that. Anyway, but Salal, interestingly, means, Tzal means the shadow. 
So Batalal actually means in the shadow of God. So art, Batalal is an artist. Then what is art? It is the shadow cast by the light. In other words, it's the expression of that light in this world. As uh, this chap, Mr. Gerth said, well, let's read Rabbi Sachs. Let's end with Rabbi Sachs in his own words. Uh, Jeff, would you like to read? I think that's Gerth it's pronounced. Do you ask me to read? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, do you want to read? Yeah. Goeth said, where there is much light, the shadow is deep. When art lets us see the wonder of creation as God's work and the human person as God's image, it becomes a powerful part of the religious life with one proviso. The Greeks believed in holiness of beauty. Jews believe in Hadrat Kodesh, the beauty of holiness. Not art for art's sake, but art as a disclosure of the ultimate artistry of the creator. That is how Omanut enhances Emona, how art adds wonder to faith. Right. So the whole message of the Mishkan we're saying is, that something artistic, something which has regality and majesty, it's not just a, we didn't just hang a cloth over the Mishkan to protect it, right? Just like we do now. Like we don't just hang a piece of plain cloth over the ark. We have a nice ornate curtain with embroidery and it gives, adds beauty. So when approached correctly, we're saying, that it can actually be a very powerful thing. If we see spirituality as light, then the shadow is the physical expression of that spirituality. That can be a very powerful thing, whether it's through music or through art or poetry or natural beauty, anything that's very physical and material. But nonetheless, right, not, I love this phrase, the Greeks believed in the holiness of beauty, right, and they worshipped it for its own sake. We believe in the beauty of holiness. So for us, holiness, and this is the whole idea of Kedushan, of, of, of bringing God into, of, we say, Asuli Mikdash, make for me a Mikdash, a sanctuary, the Shokhanti Basokham, I will dwell within you, within them. Not within it, but within them. How do we bring God into this world? Through our natural, our physical expressions of spirituality. Like every mitzvah we do, we always say, you put on to fill them, it's leather straps, but it's connected you with the infinite. Like you put a physical coin into Docker, you're connecting, tapping into the infinite. You drink alcohol, which can cause all kinds of issues, but you're doing it to connect. The spirituality of the infinite. So when you hang a beautiful curtain in front of your mishkan or your ark, or you put a beautiful cover on your sefer Torah, or you have a beautiful cup or candles, or you know the kohanim with their stunning clothing, right? Or here's an interesting one. You know, often when people are, are, are furnishing a shul, they'll say, "Well, we're a charity. You know, we should we should you know do it on the cheap." So yes, as a charity, you have to be responsible, but actually. Shouldn't your shul, where you go to serve God or to learn, be at least as, as decent as your home is, right? So if you wouldn't furnish your home with secondhand broken chairs, why would you buy them for your shul? Oh, well, we're a charity. Now, I'm not saying that people should go overboard, but the, the, the whole argument, this is the idea of Hidro Mitzvah as well, right? So anything, you know, your sukkah, your seder table, right? all these things, right? they should be elaborate. They should be beautiful, not for their own sake, but because that's how we appreciate and experience holiness as well and art and music and <clears throat> all these art <clears throat> correctly can be a very powerful thing and i would add a little bit of a controversial thing which is that um i only know from the schools my kids go to it's a complaint in a lot of schools that there's so much emphasis on basically learning torah or for that matter studying for your gcse's that a lot of schools don't put enough emphasis on expressions of artist artistry, whether it's music lessons or whether it's art lessons. Like, there's no reason that a religious school can't have art and music. Like they're a way of serving God. It's not, it shouldn't be seen as a secular trafer thing. It's a way of serving God. It can be channeled into the service of God, right? and it's often overlooked. And sometimes you'll find a child that's not so brilliant at learning Gemara that might be a brilliant musician or brilliant artist, and that's how they serve God. And if they're not given that opportunity and encouraged, then they lose out. And are, ironically, a lot of girls' schools do a lot more art and music than the boys because they don't see it as taking time away from Torah. So 
if you're somebody that is a is an absolute genius an illui we call it who's going to study Torah all day and it's a choice of you know 18 hours of Torah study or 12 hours of Torah study and six hours of piano practice then you should probably be studying Torah because that's your thing if like most people myself included even when I was in yeshiva you have a limited time concentration and you have breaks what are you going to do during your break so why shouldn't you do something that's meaningful and wholesome that is an expression of connection with God and this is the beauty of art and music obviously I have a passion for music and I see it, how powerful it is, and the powerful connection it engenders. So we see that from the Mishkan. The Mishkan wasn't just a simple, you know, prefab building. It was very elaborate. But Sal and Aliyah are praised as being craftsmen who were divinely inspired in their craft. So we see the power of craft, of art, of all these things when done correctly. I think it's a very powerful thing. I think it's something we don't always appreciate enough. So there we go. Art is anyway, very much in the eye of the beholder. Right, that's true as well. Some simple we're talking things about will, will get you, whereas some ornate things don't. Um, yes, and sometimes things are overdone and they look too yeah. ornate, and some people like them, and some people think they just look over the top. I, I imagine that the experience of the Mishkan and later of the temple would have been that there was nothing else on this scale the temple the, the size was huge it was gigantic and it was imposing and it was magnificent and i assume that that alone was a big factor in its majesty now it's like if you go to Buckingham palace you might not like the particular style of architecture or interior decoration but you can appreciate the grandeur of it yeah you, know, you appreciate the grandeur and the magnificence they used to the Hasidim in Russia used to go to the Tsar's palace. They said to see, not the Tsar, the Tsar was a tyrant, but to see, you know, if this is what a palace looks like for a, a mortal king, can you imagine God in heaven? You know, that if this if you've ever been to Windsor Castle or Buckingham Palace, they are magnificent places, they are gigantic, they're exquisite. You know, you may not have Windsor Castle quite looks quite cold and imposing in many ways. But you think, you know, if this is how the other half lives, can you imagine how the divine live? You know, it's, it's incredible when you see, it's also one of the reasons when you see a king in his robes that you make a bracha, right? you see a king, it gives you a, a, a taste of what the, if this is the king, imagine the king of kings. Right? Not that make a comparison because God is not physical, but we can appreciate when you see the king in all his majesty in his robes. Wow, that's just amazing. It's incredible. It's awe-inspiring. Now imagine what God is like. Anyway, there we go. Any questions or comments? Are you okay there? It's been very interesting. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Yeah.